Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, so, yeah, it's working. So I thank the organizers uh, and I thank Sriram to Zeroth Order for taking me on as a student uh, many years ago now. So I'll be talking about UniAxel ordering in active Stokes influence. Uh, so we have, uh, you know what active matter is. These are systems uh, containing uh, individually energized particles which perform some work while dissipating that energy. Uh, typical examples go all the way from mo motor filament systems to flocks, herds, and schools, and to various artificial realizations. And uh, while all of the systems are messier than uh, systems that one usually considers in condensed matter physics, I'll look at these systems from a condensed matter physics perspective. That is, I'll ask questions about broken symmetry, what kind of symmetries can be broken, what happens to ordering transitions, what happens to phase transitions, et cetera. Right? And I know how to do that in equilibrium very well. So we have a free energy uh, from which one can, in principle, calculate equal time correlators. And uh, if I know that, I know what phases are, or what phase transitions are allowed, what symmetries can be broken. And what that means is, uh, I don't need to know anything about the dynamics to know uh, whether a phase is possible or not and what the properties, uh, what are the equal time properties of that phase. Uh, for instance, uh, whether a system conserves momentum or not, or whether uh, it has other conserved quantities or not, doesn't matter at all. Uh, taking the example of uniaxial ordering in Stokes and fluids, I'll show that this is qualitatively and vastly different in active systems. So uniaxial ordering, uh, the possibility of uniaxial ordering in uh, Stokes and fluids was first considered by Aditya Simha and Sriram Ramaswamy during Aditya Simha's PhD. And they showed that uniaxial ordering cannot happen in Stokes and fluids, in bulk Stokes and fluids. Uh, they showed this via proof by contradiction. That is, they assumed that a uni uniaxial ordered state exists and showed that that state must always be unstable. So let's look at that in slightly more detail. Uh, so the Q tensor, uh, uh, it uh, accounts for the degree of ordering. It's basically a coarse-grained average of the dyadic composed of the vector uh, along the long axis of these particles. And the Q tensor uh, is affected by the fluid uh, velocity, both by the strain rate and the vorticity. So I need the equation for the fluid velocity to close this. And for slow Stokesian flows, this is given by balancing the viscous force densities with other force densities. And uh, the simplest, uh, the most important force density that I'll have to consider is the, this active force density, which tells me that if I have a vectorial asymmetry in the pneumatic order parameter field, this leads to a force either along the direction of the vectorial asymmetry or opposite to it, okay? And for, uh, and here I'll do the, uh, I'll display the algebra for an incompressible system. So uh, because I want to examine uh, the stability of an ordered phase, uh, I can parameterize the Q tensor in terms of an angle field in two dimensions. Everything I say will be in two dimensions. And uh, by solving the velocity field, I can immediately calculate the eigenfrequency of this angular fluctuations. Uh, this eigenfrequency is independent of wave number and is proportional to the inverse time scale that Sriram talked about yesterday, which is the ratio of viscosity divided by the active stress. This is the unique time scale. And uh, you know, throughout the talk, you should keep track of these uh, angular factors. Phi is, throughout the talk, is the uh, angle between the wave vector direction and the direction of ordering, right? And you can see from this angular factor, the first part of this angular factor, that this vanishes at phi equal to phi equal to pi by four. And in fact, it goes through a zero at phi equal to pi by four. What that means is that when you have uh, uh, zeta delta mu greater than zero, that is you have extensile particles which pushes fluid out along its long axis, then uh, aligned state is unstable for perturbations along the ordering direction, that is for bent perturbations. So this guy is positive. Whereas when you have zeta delta mu less than zero, that is you have contractile particles, uh, which pulls fluid in along its long axis, then the aligned phase is unstable to perturbations transverse to the ordering direction, that is for splay perturbations. Uh, and uh, while I, which means that, you know, uh, an active aligned state is always unstable. You can't do anything to it. And while I displayed the algebra for an incompressible system, you actually don't need the system to be incompressible. What you need are two conservation laws. You need the conservation law for momentum, and you need a mass and number conservation law. You don't need this density to be incompressible, really. And uh, this uh, Simharamasam instability is the cause of uh, lots of, you know, I mean, cause of uh, both regular and irregular flows seen in a 
wide range of uh, biological systems. Uh, and it's been very well studied in various contexts. But I actually want to talk about uh, orientational ordering in Stokes and fluids. So how can I get an orientationally ordered state in Stokes and fluids? So well, I have to break one of these conservation laws. So I start by breaking momentum conservation, and I start with a pneumatic system, right? Yep. The total mass conservation, the fluid plus the power. Fluid plus, okay. Yep. okay. Uh, so how do I uh, break momentum conservation? So I can consider a thin film uh, on a substrate or between two plates, right? And that, uh, then the plates act as momentum sinks, right? And uh, so we sort of naively expect that, okay, uh, the Simharamasum instability is a hydrodynamic instability. So if I cut off fluid dynamics at the scale H, then uh, if I look at orientational ordering in the XY plane, and I look at scales much larger than the scale H, then the viscous uh, force density becomes uh, sort of friction, gives me a sort of friction. And uh, the active uh, growth rate now is not Q to the power zero, but Q squared. So it directly competes with the frank elasticity of the pneumatic. Therefore, uh, uh, therefore, the instability doesn't happen at zero activity, but at a finite activity. But still, if you look at this a little bit, you notice that if I keep increasing delta mu, if I keep increasing activity, then I'll inevitably become unstable. That's what this predicts, right? However, it turns out to be a little more complicated, and it's a little more complicated because the system is now not extensive in the z direction, and therefore we sort of need to uh, be a little more careful about the gradient expansion in a bulk theory, because you already know that, you know, uh, we got a friction from uh, viscosity, right? So basically, gradients in the z direction are not small. Gradients in z direction, uh, z is a thin direction, so its gradients are not small. So a higher order force density which I would have ignored in bulk theory, can give me a term of this sort in the Z average theory. And this is an active force density, which cannot be written as a divergence of a stress. It's, it, it requires dissipation, so it's only possible in a system in which momentum is not conserved. Uh, and this force density has a different angular symmetry from the usual active force density. And in a sense, what this tells me is that the active force for a splay perturbation and a bend perturbation are different. That's all it's really telling me. And that's not very surprising. Because, uh, you know, if I have, uh, so if I asked, if I have a system on a substrate, what is the, uh, I could get a force density if I have a polarization. And what is the polarization in the pneumatic? Well, uh, in general, it would have different, uh, general polarization in the pneumatic would have different coefficients for splay and bend as you know, people who have looked at flexoelectricity ages ago, like Jacques Pro and others, would have told you, sorry? Um, 50 years ago. <laughs> right. So I again uh, look at the stability of an ordered state. Uh, I again parameterize uh, the Q tensor in terms of the angle field with this guy here. And uh, you see that you know, this is the promised uh, different active force density for splay and bend. And if you look at the eigenfrequency for the angular fluctuation now, you see that it has acquired this extra zeta 2 piece, which tells you uh, that uh, this whole bit here, this active bit here, doesn't change sine around pi by 4. And in fact, if you look at the parameters, you can, you can actually see that this term can remain negative, can re this whole thing, without the negative sign, be, can be negative for all values of uh, zeta 1 and zeta 2, for, sorry, for all values of phi for some choices of zeta 1 and zeta 2. What that means is that uh, if I crank up activity, I still have a sort of quasi long range order pneumatic phase, but if I crank up act activity, the relaxation rate uh, increases because the effective elasticity of the phase increases, right? Uh, so you have a quasi long, you can have a quasi long range ordered pneumatic at arbitrary activity and which is becomes sort of more and more stable as you crank up activity. And uh, this is a sort of a deep cut, but you know, if you look at large scales, uh, Q div Q actually dominates over div Q because, let me not go there, uh, the Q div, 
but you know, if Q div Q exists, it should be more important than div Q at large scales. Okay, and uh, this kind of stabilization of active pneumatics was probably seen in an experiment by Masaki Sano. This is an experiment uh, on bacteria, and you can see that they ha have a more or less decent pneumatic order, actually a fairly good pneumatic order, but if you sort of put in rough, somewhat hand-waving numbers, uh, we, in the presence of just the div Q stress, one would think that this should be unstable, okay? So that's, that completes uh, what I wanted to say about the apolar pneumatic ordering. Now let's consider polar ordering uh, on a substrate. So I'm still considering momentum non-conserved systems, but now polar. And uh, by now we are, uh, we are used to the idea that, you know, in confined fluids, subdominant terms in bulk equations can become important. And there are two such terms in the polarization equation, in the polar uh, theory. One is this kind of a del squared V like term, which tells you that in addition to aligning along the strain rate, a polar object can align along the curvature of a velocity. And then you have this kind of uh, active polar force density, which was first uh, looked at by Krishna Marchetti, Luca Giovanni, and Tani Liverpool, which, is, which has one extra gradient on this. Uh, so this is the passive flow, polar flow alignment, and this is the active polar force density. And if you thickness average this thing, uh, those equations, what the first, uh, you know, the del uh, polarization going as del squared V, what it gives you is a, uh, Weathercock term that Sriram showed you yesterday. It basically tells you, if you are on a substrate, a polar vector can align with the local velocity and not only its gradient, right? And you have a motility. Uh, the polar active force density gives you a motility, right? So you can look at a steadily flowing state in this system. So you, you can look at a P0 going as P0x hat. And you have, importantly, you have long range interaction due to incompressibility here. Right, the fluid is incompressible. So upon thickness averaging, you get a two-dimensional incompressibility, right? What that tells you is that if you look at the high, uh, angular fluctuations now, if you solve for the velocity field and calculate the angular fluctuations, for most directions, the angular fluctuations have a mass. So it has a relaxation rate for most directions of a vector, uh, which doesn't vanish at Q going to Z, as Q goes to zero. And that immediately tells you that you have long range order in the system. And this actually can be mapped on exactly to an equilibrium dipolar magnet in a particular limit. I'm not going to tell you exactly what is the condition in which it can, this mapping works, which allows us, which allows us to exactly, I mean, not us, uh, this was done by Chen, Lee, and Toner. It, allows the, it allowed them to calculate the exact static exponents. Uh, actually, this was done before them by Kashuba uh, because it's an equilibrium dipolar magnet. And uh, we can do an RG to calculate the dynamic exponent from the, the, of this model, right? And uh, this sort of mass generation is sort of a surprising variant of uh, the Anderson-Higgs mechanism. And the reason it's surprising is because the velocity field itself has a zero wave number relaxation rate. So what's giving you the long range interaction is really the incompressibility. It's, uh, and the incompressibility is on the velocity field, but because of the form of the polar activity, that incompressibility of the velocity field somehow gets transferred into, the, into an effective sort of incompressibility of the polarization field, which is kind of surprising. And uh, this sort of uh, quasi mass has other interesting effects. One being that, you know, if you now consider uh, quench disorder on the substrate, uh, the polar flock still retains long range order even in the presence of quench disorder. And we managed to calculate the exponents uh, for this on a disordered substrate. And, for, and this is really the only system I know of where you have uh, long range order even in two dimensions, even in the presence of quench disorder. Uh, this would not happen uh, in the dipolar magnet because uh, for this bit, for uh, stabilization, in the presence of quench disorder, self-advection turns out to be important, right? Okay, so I have told you that uh, when I have fluids on substrates, these can have, be anomalously stable. Activity can anomalously stabilize fluids on substrates, Stokes in fluids on substrates. Uh, again, 
and note that you know this is not something that would be happening in equilibrium, right? I mean, in equilibrium, if you had a bulk which was unstable, if you put it on a substrate, it would still be unstable in general, right? So now I'll tell you, uh, in a sense, what happens if I can somehow uh, eliminate the second uh, conservation law while retaining the first one? It's not quite that, but somewhat like that. Let's bear with me, okay? So what I'll consider now is uh, uh, an ordering at the interface between, uh, between two fluids. And uh, so you have an active fluid where the particles can easily can get exchanged between the bulk and the interface. So there is no conservation law of, for the particles at, in the interface. And you have two global momentum conservation. So you have uh, this 3D fluid conserves momentum. And uh, the particles have to line up parallel to the interface when they get to the interface. They cannot line up normal to it. They are forced to be parallel. So what I'm going to consider is the ordering uh, of particles in the xy plane, right? And the important point here to note is that though the global fluid is incompressible, the interface itself, the surface velocity at the interface, the interfacial velocity field is not incompressible. And the reason is that you can have a fluid flow in the z direction, right? You have del z vz at the interface need not be zero, right? So the 2D boundary flow is not incompressible. So I'm looking at interfacial order, so I'll talk about, an, I'll use an interfacial order parameter Q, so this is a rank two, uh, this is the tensor I have throughout the talk actually. And I'll have an interfacial surface stress proportional to that Q tensor. My interfacial velocity can be calculated from the interfacial force density uh, using this mobility tensor. Importantly, this mobility tensor goes as one over the wave number. It's one over the wave number uh, because it's a two-dimensional interface in a three-dimensional fluid. Uh, and uh, again, if I look at the stability, because I'm looking at a stability about an order of an ordered phase, I can parameterize the interfacial force density stemming from that interfacial stress in terms of an angle field. And the dynamics of the angle field to lowest order in gradients is completely determined by the interfacial velocity field. The effects of elasticity come in at next order in gradients, right? So I can, again, get, I can uh, calculate the uh, eigenvalue for, the eigenfrequency for uh, the angular fluctuations. And if you just look at this, this is the bit that you were familiar with. This is the bit that, uh, you know, comes from Shimara Masson instability, et cetera. And you have this extra big piece. So where does this extra piece come from? Well, this extra piece comes from the fact that, you know, neither the fluid nor the number of particles, and I'll tell you why the not the number of particles bit is important in a minute. This comes from the fact that there is no conservation law for the fluid at the interface. And there is, and you can see immediately that if you had, if the surface interface velocity were incompressible, this term could not have existed. Uh, and, uh, you know, this bit, uh, I mean, except for this term in red, this was calculated for an interfa interfacial uh, active pneumatic for Mike Shelley and co workers uh, a few years ago. Uh, for for the case in which uh, the interface is suffused with uh, various kinds of peg or something, so that various kinds of crowding agents, so you have effective incompressibility at the interface, right? But if you don't have incompressibility at the interface, you have this extra term. And notice that this bit does not vanish at pi equal to five, pi equal to pi by four. And in fact, this term, this whole thing in the square bracket, can be stabilizing for all pi. Okay. Uh, of course, it doesn't happen for all parameters, but there are, there's a large range of parameters for it, which this is stable, okay? And if this is stable, if you calculate the static structure factor of angular fluctuations, you have to add noise to it to calculate this, of course. So if you calculate static structure factor of angular fluctuations, that goes as one over Q, and that immediately tells you you have two-dimensional two long-range order. You can go further and show that there is no relevant nonlinearity in the problem. It cannot happen cannot have a relevant nonlinearity. So this linear theory is all that you have, actually. And this is a sort of bizarre kind of odd interfacial ordering because it's an interfacial ordering in a system which has no bulk order. There's no possibility of a bulk order, right? Uh, what that means is there is no parameter value for this, for which this interfacial weighting layer 
sort of acquires a macroscopic thickness. It's all, it always remains uh, microscopically thin. And, uh, you know, the funny thing is that, you know, the same active stress that's giving you semi-homosomy instability in the bulk actually ends up screening the fluctuations at the interface. Uh, so, you know, it's the same acti active effect. It's not two different stresses. It's the same active effect. It's as if you have sort of a gravitational genes-like bulk instability and uh, with the, in the same system as you, in which you have a Coulomb-like screening at the interface. And uh, I should thank Sriam for this uh, statement. Uh, right. Okay. So now I'll tell you, you know, why I was mentioning that, you know, you need particle exchange. Because if you have a state in which you force the active particles to lie at the interface, so the number of active particles at the interface is cons uh, conserved, then uh, nematic order is generically unstable. There is no nematic state. Uh, the instability is different in detail, not really in any, in, in any much of a qualitative sense, but in detail it's somewhat different from instability of incompressible active pneumatic fluids, and the difference is the following. If you had an incompressible active pneumatic fluid, then the instability length scale would go down with uh, the activity, whereas now you be, the instability length scale basically saturates at a value determined by the compressibility of the compressibility of the uh, apolar, or the nematogens, right? In contrast, if you have a state in which you have a polar motile flock at the interface with the number being conserved at the interface, then this can be stable because it escapes the instability of the apolar flock by, toner, by using toner to waves. And uh, in fact, you know, mathematically this is somewhat similar, actually very similar mathematically only, not the physics of it, but mathematically this is very similar to how uh, uh, toner to waves help uh, polar flocks escape the semi-homosome instability in inertial systems, right? So what uh, Prasad talked about yesterday, right? And here you can see again, uh, there is a reasonable range of parameters for which you have a homogeneous polar phase. And again, here, the linear theory is exact. There is no relevant nonlinearity. This is all you get. Okay. So uh, many natural exper many experimental systems uh, for examining pattern formation in active fluids actually are interfacial uh, systems, actually. And what this shows you is that there is really no fundamental reason uh, for, we for, the inst uh, for uh, an ordered state to be inst unstable in these geometries, in these geometries, so it really depends on experimental details. I mean, for instance, the system here it actually is effectively incompressible. The layer is effectively incompressible because of the huge amount of peg pumped into this layer. Actually, so, uh, but you know, one could, in principle, create systems in which uh, one allows for uh, microtubules to shrink and grow. And uh, then there would be no reason for that system to be in for that system to have a generic instability. Also, this kind of uh, ordering may have may be natural in bacterial fluids. And uh, you know, if you have a, a sort of liquid-liquid phase separation in a system with elongated particles, elongated active particles, you can uh, form a protocortex in the liquid in the dense phase. In principle, yeah. Uh, so I'll summarize. Uh, uh, because I'm running out of time as well. Uh, so what Simura-Masumi instability tells you is that you cannot have order in strokes in bulk fluids, but what this discussion shows you is that it doesn't preclude ordering in strokes in fluids even at infinite activity. Uh, if, you have, uh, fluids, if you have fluids on substrates, you can have a pneumatic phase at arbitrary activity which with a relaxation rate that increases with activity. You can have a polar phase uh, with a almost massive number Goldstone mode. And uh, you can have interfacial long range ordered polar and apolar phases in bulk strokes in fluids, where you know, the fluid flows that destabilize bulk order actually ends up anomalously stabilizing interfacial order. And while uh, pneumatic order is not possible when particles live at the interface, uh, motile flocks can still have long range order. And uh, so the real theoretical uh, sort of uh, fun 
thing here is that, you know, unlike in passive system, even the existence of an ordered state, whether a symmetry can be broken or not, really depends on, you know, fine details of the system, whether you have uh, exactly how you have encompassability, whether you have particle number conservation or not. It really depends on all, everything. And uh, it also means that, you know, Simha-Hamasamy instability essentially does not preclude ordering uh, at any activity in most, you know, experimental systems. Uh, so I'll thank my uh, collaborators. Uh, uh, you know, uh, much of this was done with Sriram even when he was not a part of the paper. Uh, the first two bits uh, were with Christina and uh, Martin and uh, uh, Pragya and uh, Yuho. And uh, the RG calculations was with John and Chufan Lee, John Toner, Chufan Lee, and Lenny Chen. Thanks. Yeah. Well, anyway, do, do you know what uh, fluctuations of the interface will do to your, uh, to your older? Much. As so it will as, be, the older will be maintained? As long as you have a tangential, uh, as long as the pneumatics are on the tangent plane, you are fine. If the pneumatics can tilt away from the tangent plane, you are not. So what you need is, uh, we, so I was just talking to Jaffa before this actually. So what you need is the anchoring condition to change. Right, but there is, a, there is something that has been called also active anchoring, which means that the, the pneumatic tend to be tangential to the interface, actually, I think. Yeah, right. but uh, if you have a cost for anchor, so here it's basically an infinitely strong anchoring, right? So there is no, uh, there's no possibility of tilting out of the mm -hmm. interface. So if it does tilt out of the interface, I'm not exactly sure what happens. Mm -hmm. I have not uh, looked at it, but I think that will destroy some of this at least. Oh, so there are many differences. So one is that this is incompressible. Vonomir's setup is always 2D incompressible. It's 2D incompressible because it is, for many, probably many reasons, but the chief of them, I think, is because it's pumped full with, of PEG or PDM, uh, whatever that other object is, PEG or, and what else is it? Yeah, PMMH, sorry. PMMH and PEG or something. I see, I see. Okay. I see. Yeah. Yes. 